actually Friday since we started. Uh, we have a sort of busy, busy agenda. Uh, busy agenda. Um, great. Um, can we have the Mr. Espinosa? Can you please call the roll? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilmember Soto Martinez. Here. Councilmember Hutt. Present. Councilmember Hernandez. Councilmember Hernandez is currently absent. Councilmember Price. Here. And Councilmember Rodriguez. Member Rodriguez is currently absent, so we have three members in a quorum. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Espinosa. Um, so we have a pretty uh, light agenda today, only four items. Um, a couple of them are about uh, the justice, one is about the Justice Fund, the other one is about Sanctuary City. We do have a report uh, from the Department of Aging with a slight amendment, and then a report back on the violence and crime that black women and girls experience in the city. And um, uh, Mr. Clerk, can you please uh, read the instructions for public comment? Thank you. Uh, members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 160-047-1942 and then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for the participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star nine to request to speak. Thank you so much. Do we have someone doing uh, Spanish interpretation today? Yes. Great. A uh, los miembros uh, del público que deseen ofrecer sus comentarios públicos sobre los temas enumerados en la agenda deben llamar al 1-669-254-5252 y usar el número de, de identificación de la reunión 1-600-047-1242. 1942 y luego presionar asterisco. Presione asterisco nuevamente cuando se le solicite la identificación del participante. Una vez admitido en la reunión, presione asterisco 9 para solicitar hablar. El intérprete estará disponible para traducir comentarios del español al inglés. Muchas muchas gracias, uh, Julia, por la interpretación. Uh, can we please have uh, the city attorney read the public comment guidelines? Uh, Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. To members of the public calling in, when it, when it is your turn to speak, please state your name and which of the agenda items you would like to speak on. You will have one minute to speak on one agenda item or two minutes to speak on multiple items. In addition, you will have one minute if you wish to speak on general public comment. We will inform you when your time is up. When speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you are not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell whether you are speaking on an agenda item, you will get one brief warning from the city attorney or the chair. If you do not immediately get clearly on topic, or if you stray off topic, you will forfeit the rest of your time and we will move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mrs. Mrs. Aubrey. Uh, can we have uh, Ms. Noriega, please uh, give those instructions in Spanish, please? A los miembros del público que llamen cuando sea su turno de hablar, indique su nombre y sobre qué temas de la agenda desea hablar. Tendrá un minuto para hablar sobre un tema de la agenda o dos minutos para hablar sobre varios temas. Además, tendrá un minuto extra si desea hablar sobre comentarios del público general. Le informaremos cuando se acabe su tiempo. Cuando hable sobre los puntos de la agenda, debe permanecer en el tema. Nuestro objetivo es comunicarnos con tantos oradores como sea posible. Si no está hablando sobre el tema o si no podemos saber si está hablando sobre un tema de la agenda, recibirá una breve advertencia del fiscal de la ciudad o del presidente. Si no se enfoca claramente en el tema de inmediato o si se desvía del tema, perderá el resto de su tiempo y pasaremos al siguiente orador. Muchas gracias, señorita Noriega. And uh, we're now going to public comment. Uh, Mr. Menhekar, can you please uh, lead us in that? Absolutely. Um, caller with the last four digits, 0518. Uh, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hi, this is Marissa Rosenberg Carlson. I want to speak about item number two, the sanctuary uh, motion. Great, you have a minute for public comment. Please begin. Great, thank you. Um, as I said, my name is Marissa Rosenberg Carlson. Um, I'm a second year law student at UCLA School of Law. I'm the executive director of Law Students for Immigrant Justice, um, and I'm a student of the Immigrant Rights Policy Clinic and the Immigrant Family Legal Clinic. And I'm just calling to express my support for the Sanctuary LA motion. 
Um, as a law student, I serve immigrant children uh, in the school system in the LAUSD who will directly benefit from this motion. Um, Los Angeles should really be a city where these children and their families feel safe engaging with city departments and services rather than worrying that doing so will allow them to be picked up by ICE. Uh, and LA should use its resources to support its immigrant communities, not to assist ICE in tearing them apart. Um, and a sanctuary motion will protect our this immigrant community um, from harm, just from harmful entanglement with ICE. And that includes students, families, uh, veterans, street vendors, and all other immigrants who make our city thrive. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Um, uh, the next person up is a call in user one. Uh, please state your name and uh, the items you would like to speak on. Hello, good afternoon. This is Shuming Chir. I'd like to speak on items number two and three. Great, you have uh, two minutes for the items. Please begin. Great, thank you. So, hi, I'm calling on behalf of the California Immigrant Policy Center, where I am the Deputy Director of Programs and Campaigns. And I'm speaking in support of both of those items because we know that the majority of Californians want to see their immigrant neighbors protected from ICE enforcement. So we need to make sure that our laws actually represent and reflect this public will to provide sanctuary. We need to create a city where migrants can live with dignity and without the fear of deportation, where every person has a right to move and to live freely without being separated from their loved ones or being displaced from their homes. Um, we, we also know that detentions and deportations deprive immigrant Californians of their liberty, separate them from their loved ones, and exclude them from their communities. So this goes not only against our deepest values, it also decimates our neighborhoods and communities. By providing sanctuary in LA, we are working to build a stronger California. So that's why I urge you to move the sanctuary motion forward. By doing so, you'll affirm the city's commitment to racial justice and to protecting and defending immigrants. Um, for the California Immigrant Policy Center, we also support agenda item number three, moving the CAO report on the LA Justice Fund forward so that city funds can be distributed to the organizations that are providing critical legal and community services and supports for immigrants. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, up next is a uh, call-in user. Uh, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. the stakeholder agenda number two in general public comment please great you have two minutes uh one for the item one for general public comment please begin thank you um i took i wanted to make note of something in the motion for the sanctuary city a rather almost not even thought about line something even minor traffic violations um some time ago, a very well-known Los Angeles periodical had done, was doing a story on deportations, and an immigration attorney was discussing clients that they had been um, defending, um, some of the criminal activity they were responsible for, and this immigration attorney, not a notary, an immigration attorney stated the following, and I will quote, Something minor like DUI, DUI being driving under the influence. An immigration attorney de-evaluated DUI to something minor. So I hope that this motion is rewritten in consideration so that all residents of the city of Los Angeles are safe. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, up next, uh, caller with the last four digits, 8546. Please unmute yourself, uh, state your name and, and the items you'd like to speak on. Um, my name is Chaco Quigley. I'd like to speak on item two, the sanctuary motion. Great, you have a minute for that item. Uh, please begin. Um, so I'm the proud daughter of an immigrant and a second year student at UCLA School of Law um, at UCLA. I'm a co-chair of the VAWA U visa clinic and the Immigrants' Rights Policy Clinic. Um, I'm calling on behalf of these clinics to give our strong support for the Sanctuary LA motion. Um, we're aware that Los Angeles is facing a crisis in the form of a growing rift between members of the community and enforcement officials. 
This risk, this risk is exacerbated by local cooperation with ICE. Uh, on a personal level, UCLA is home to a vibrant, undocumented student population. These students are integral parts of the UCLA community, and policies that harm these students erode trust we have in local government. Uh, we should strive to implement policies that promote trust between community members in the city. This ordinance will keep the information of community members safe when they engage with city authorities or seek city services. It will allow our community to begin rebuilding trust in the city of Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next caller uh, with the last four digits, 8841. Please unmute yourself and uh, state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hi, this is Victor Naro. I would like to speak to item number two, the sanctuary motion. Excellent. You have a, a minute for that item. Please begin. Thank you. My name is Victor Naro, Professor of Labor Studies and Project Director for the UCLA Labor Center. I first want to thank the council members who introduced and second, seconded this motion. I want to address the need for this policy from the perspective of low-wage workers in Los Angeles. There are 26 low-wage industries in Los Angeles with, with an estimated 800,000 low-wage workers. This is a mostly immigrant workforce, and in some industries like garment and car wash and day laborers, the majority are undocumented workers. This workforce is an indispensable part of the LA economy. In their daily work, uh, they interact with LA City departments and services in so many ways, from transportation to seeking services from the Office of Waste Standards and other departments. It, this policy will protect these workers and their families from the potential reach of immigrant enforcement. Los Angeles, Los Angeles should be a, a city where these workers and their families can feel safe when engaging with all city departments and services and not worry that information will, can be gathered and shared with immigration authorities. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. Um, uh, next caller is the caller with the last four digits, 2094. Please unmute yourself, uh, state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Good afternoon, this is Byron Jose. Speaking on agenda item one, two, three, four, and general public comment. Great, you have two minutes for the items and one for general public comment. Please begin. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Byron Jose with the Trans Latino Coalition. Um, thank you for uh, the members of this committee for being here today and listening to the public. Uh, we want to thank Council Member Unisis, uh, Martinez, and Heather Hutt for co and uh, Raman for co-sponsoring the Sanctuary City motion. Again, we want to make sure that the city continue investing funds to truly care for the community and provide services and investment, as opposed to continue using city uh, resources funding and the police department to continue to criminalize and um, pretty much like hunt down immigrants, right? For civilians through this, uh, all these systems. And as someone mentioned already, yes, uh, DUI is not a minor thing, right? But uh, when we look at the history of the way that different communities get policed, specifically uh, immigrants, right? So there's a disparate impact that the city itself has a history of funding things that historically criminalized these communities. So now is the time for us to shift some of that narrative. Uh, similarly with item agenda item number one, right? We look forward to making sure that uh, when we look at aging population, we look at immigrants, um, folks that have been here for years, decades, uh, who through their immigration status may not have access to city resources. Um, so we want to make sure that it gets impacted specifically, again, looking at transgender, gender expensive and intersex uh, elders, aging population, but also young people. We want to make sure that as the city continue moving forward, we continue to actively and time again um, uphold values that care for the community. So as we so moving on to agenda item three with the LA Justice Fund, uh, going back to that again, we look forward for uh, we want to thank all the work the city this commitment uh, had last year, but we look forward for this committee and the whole body itself to truly expand uh, what services look for the community and move some of the exclusions that we have had in the past. Um, I don't know how much time I have, but definitely supporting anything that impacts the way that, again, the city uh, can fund resources for black women, for girls, and for communities that this, that this, that this city has historically marginalized. And we look forward to working with every uh, member in this committee and the rest of the city council members on different budget item requests specifically for trans TGI, transgender, gender expensive, and intersex communities and immigrant communities. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you. Uh, next caller uh, with the last four digits, 2646. Uh, please state your name and the items you would like to speak on. Hi, uh, my name is Joanna Reyes. I'm, I'd like to speak to item two and three, please. Great, you have a minute for each item. Uh, please begin. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, council members. My name is Joanna Reyes. I'm calling on behalf of the Central American Resource Center of Los Angeles. We appreciate and applaud the Sanctuary LA motion, which will begin the process for LA City to establish a long overdue policy to disentangle its resources, personnel, and property from ICE. Immigrant Angelinos continue to face attacks from federal immigration system, and we can no longer uh, add to a system that disproportionately affects migrants of color. 2.2 million non-citizens residing in Los Angeles are potentially at risk of deportation, and 1.6 million children in Los Angeles have at least one immigrant parent. In addition, there are over half a million Central Americans in Los Angeles who have been vulnerable to the anti-immigrant rhetoric spread by xenophobia. A local sanctuary policy would defend immigrant communities from the harmful effects of the racist immigration system kept keeping our Angelino families together. LA should be a city where people can feel safe uh, when engaging with the city departments and services and not worry that information will be gathered and shared with immigration authorities. Sanctuary policies help uphold our values of compassion, equality, and common humanity. Uh, if the city is committed to standing up for immigrant residents, then you must support this effort to prohibit any entanglement with the detention and deportation systems. We ask for you to move this motion forward. By doing so, you will affirm the city's commitment to racial justice and protecting uh, and defending immigrants. In addition, um, we ask for your support of the Represent LA program, which is a critical tool for serving our vulnerable immigrant communities in Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next caller with the last four digits, 1403. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. You have uh, two minutes for the items and one for general public comment. Please begin. It is very good. I agree with the immigration of LA. But the UI is not cheap. It should, everybody should be given one in the UI like Mulligan. That's the cost of play gold. He hit it up the pound, you get that extra shot. When you get DUI, you should get free DUI. Everybody, no matter your immigration status, no matter your cover, no matter how many you hammer it out. And on today, I see Patrick saying, I appreciate LAPD has agreed not to issue any DUI tickets in honor of the drunken holiday of the Irish. Let's give everybody hand. This is very good. Thank you. This is a good thing to have. The Asylum status called the sanctuary city. And as far as paying these attorneys, this is very good. I only rob one ticker store, I swear. I only rob one ticker store. And as far as importing the 500 pounds of cocaine, the FBI could not prove the other. I, citizen of the United States, I bring my four brothers, my six sisters, to have four husbands of their own, which we will bring over the next year. Thanks to the strong that Nidia Rahman, the Nidia Rahman tell me all about it. But what concern I have is you are sending Eric Arsati to my country. We do not want Eric Arsati in our country. He bad influence on the younger men. He tried to teach the younger men to take photographs with other men reaching behind the cock. Dropping the deep of other men, we do not approve of this. This is against our religious policy. We try to raise men, not to reach for other deep, but to have children. So one day we take over the entire world. While you only have 280 million people, we have 1.2 billion people. And by 2045, we have 300 billion people. And then we take over the entire world. That's why we need to our city. That's why we need the UI. That's why we need Hugo Soto Martinez. That's why we need you, Nisi Fernandez, and especially our leader, our cultural leader, Nisi Rabin, who goes to Harvard and MIT to study these things, to bring all of us over here. But we take over. The people here, the white people here, do not have babies because we take and get abortion. And then you have a portion, and we have nine kids for families. See what happens? We take over the world. <laughs> yes, that's great. And a shout out to my friends over in the Chinese Republic. Thank you. It is very good. And thank you to Mr. Jose Wizard. Thank you, 
you be for the reason for not talking to FBI and uh, next caller with the last four digits six or sorry seven six eight six please state your name and the items you would like to speak on caller with the last four digits seven six oh uh, uh, please state your hello, name hello this is hello this is Bruno speaking on um, agenda item number two in general public comment great you have a minute for the item and one for general public comment please begin Thank you. Hello, my name is Bruno, um, and I live in District 13 and work with the California Immigrant Policy Center. Thank you so much, um, all of you in the committee today, and especially thank you, ever, uh, the council members who introduced the Sanctuary LA motion, uh, which will begin the process for the City of Los Angeles to establish a policy to disentangle resources, personnel, and property from ICE. I have lived in Los Angeles for over 30 years and have witnessed my own family being separated by immigration enforcement, as well as countless neighbors and classmates in public schools here in Los Angeles who have had their families separated by immigration enforcement. Those of us who know people who've been impacted by uh, ICE and immigration enforcement know there are thousands of us in Angelinos, young people, adults, families, elders who have been separated by the inhumane and racist policies of immigration enforcement. Therefore, a local sanctuary policy would defend immigrant communities from the racist and harmful policies of our immigration system and keep Angelino families together and safe. Immigrants make up 33% of Los Angeles City, and it is critical that our city of Los Angeles protect immigrants by disentangling its resources, personnel, and property from ICE. Immigrant Angelinos continue to face attacks from the federal immigration system. Thousands of families have been deported and detained by ICE, and many more families will continue to be detained, targeted, and deported by ICE and immigration enforcement. So I ask you today to take a stance and be on the right side of history and support the local sanctuary policy. It will protect our immigrant community members from harmful entanglement with ICE. This includes students, families, veterans, street vendors, and all of the immigrants who made LA City thrive. Uh, thank you so much and um, uh, urging you to support the LA Sanctuary Motion. Thank you. Um, call in user two, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Um, Caller, please state your name. Would you like to speak on? Speaker, please state the items you would like to speak on. Uh, Chair, uh, there are no more callers on the queue. This is the city attorney. Are there any more raised hands to speak? Uh, no, the, the, the uh, no more public callers. Yeah, my Zoom. Something's going on. Hello, right? this is this is the city attorney. May I ask a question? Have the uh, caller callers uh, whose last four digits are, in one case, uh, eight five four six, in another case, two zero nine four, another one two six four six, and another seven six eight six been called upon? Yes. Thank you very much. All right. My apologies. My my Zoom was acting funky for a little bit. Uh, okay, so we're done with public comment. Um, all right. Going into um, item one, uh, Mr. Clerk, can you please read item one into uh, 
set the table first, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Item number one is are some reports from the Department of Aging relative to accepting health insurance counseling and advocacy program or HICAP grant funds, amending the standard agreement for HICAP and ex executing a contract with the Center for Health Care Rights for HICAP related services. And council member, this is uh, Chris Espinosa from the CLA's office. Um, this item was considered and approved by the committee on March 3rd, 2023. Um, however, the department has two reports on the file. So the December 8th, 2022 report is no longer relevant and the disposition can be received and filed while the February 22nd, 2023 report may be adopted. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Espinosa. So my understanding, this is just a technical amendment from the CLA. Uh, we were asked to revisit it and, you know, pretty, pretty simple. Uh, it's essentially a receive and file and the adoption of, of this. Is that correct, Mr. Espinosa? Yes, just to clean up the file when it goes forward to council. Okay, wonderful. So I would, without objection, I would like to uh, do that, receive and file and then adopt the, uh, the recommendation. Um, uh, have any objections? No, okay, uh, Mr. Espinosa, the other Espinosa, can you please uh, call the roll, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilmember Soto Martinez? Yes. Councilmember Hutt? Aye. Councilmember Hernandez? Councilmember Hernandez is absent. Councilmember Price? Aye. And Councilmember Rodriguez? Aye. Thank you, so um, yes, um, the 12-8, the 2020, uh, 2022 report is received and filed, and the February 22nd, 2023 report is approved. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Espinosa. Uh, great, uh, can you please uh, add, uh, read the item number two for us, please? Thank you, item number two is a motion from Council Member Rahmet et al and Price and Hutt relative to prohibiting city resources, property, and personnel from being utilized for any federal immigration enforcement and related matters. Great, thank you so much. Uh, you know, this is a motion that uh, was introduced uh, very recently. Uh, I was very happy to uh, be a part of that as well. Uh, and so I wanna talk about a little bit about, we heard a lot of public comment today about this, and I really want to just going to give a brief uh, synopsis of what this is. Uh, we'll be vote. We'll be voting on is should this go to a full council so that eventually we can have a report back and an ordinance written for us so that we can discuss this. But this essentially stems from uh, an executive an executive directive uh, that was done by uh, uh, by Eric Garcetti a few years ago. It essentially said that it prevents the city resources uh, from being used uh, in immigration enforcement, it prevents city employees from assisting ICE and other immigration authorities when the primary purpose is immigration enforcement. It prevents the city uh, employees from giving, from giving immigration uh, uh, authorities special access to city facilities. Uh, it prevents city employees from gathering or sharing information about documentation status unless it is legally required. Uh, this was an executive directive uh, and uh, was not law or isn't law. Uh, and I think what we've seen many places when we don't enshrine uh, rights into law, uh, there is always the threat of that being removed. Uh, the most recent uh, iteration of that is uh, women's reproductive rights. Uh, it's happened before uh, with DACA, right? It was an exec it was an executive order by Obama. It's put uh, into um, a lot of turmoil due to the presidency after that. And so what we're saying is, is that we want to just make this into law. Uh, it would enshrine the policies uh, from the previous executive director into law so they can't be repealed by a future administration. Uh, and uh, we're asking to uh, also and, and look into how we can do this a little bit better, a little further. Uh, and that's asking to see if we can prevent ICE or immigration authorities from accessing city jails to interrogate people in LAPD custody, which we know happens uh, still in the city of Los Angeles. And we're also asking for um, requesting a report on how to prevent the city from working with or entering into contracts 
with private companies that compile data to share information with ICE immigration authorities. Uh, you know, this is, uh, we hear like the proliferation of technology uh, in our country, and we're asking for a report back to see if we can do that and try to stop that. So I think these are all uh, amazing things that we should be uh, enshrining into law. I think uh, when, we t when we think about what this city represents, what my di what my district represents, uh, it's the diversity. That's what makes us a, a welcoming, uh, beautiful uh, city for a lot of folks. And so um, this is just simply uh, a vote uh, so that we can get this into motion. And so I, I'm asking for my colleagues to obviously uh, move forward with, uh, with this vote and a yes vote. Uh, I see, uh, we'll open up to questions from my other colleagues. So uh, uh, I see Monica has her digital hand raised. So the floor is yours, Ms. Councilman Rodriguez. Thank you so much. Um, so I, uh, I want to thank all the callers for, for calling in and I appreciate um, the, the premise of what this motion is offering. Um, I'm, what I was confused about is some of the suggestions of the cooperative efforts that have actually been engaged by local government with ICE. Um, but more importantly, uh, the suggestion that the city hasn't already adopted these principles, it's reflected in special order 40 uh, and we do a lot of work uh, with many of the same advocacy groups that have in fact been advocating for this. Um, you know, I, I will just say, and I, so I'd like actually, I wanted to amend this to include a report on where we're actually failing to do this uh, in terms of the suggestions that um, the cooperations, I'd like to understand what we're actually, where we are actually cooperating in these things as part of the report, just to better understand, because there's a lot of suggested language in this that I, I don't know is, I, I'd like to be in, better informed about which uh, tenets of, of what's being suggested here, because, you know, I, I recall one of the things that happened when we had taken the prohibition on, um, you know, and because uh, as someone who actually visited some of the uh, detainment centers uh, in Texas, in Florida, um, you know, we were working on reunification when uh, President Biden came in and we couldn't do reunification in the city. Uh, we had to go, the county had to open up the, in Pomona to do reunification because we had taken policy positions that prohibited uh, any work with that. So um, I just want to get a sense of, I, you know, I, I support this, obviously we've, uh, with resources that we've dedicated for the Justice Fund, which I look forward uh, to engaging in the conversation in the subsequent conversation. Um, but, you know, again, and I agree with you, yes, we should codify it, but just to be clear, um, we change laws all the time. And, uh, that's what this council actually does is change policy. So happy to codify, uh, what we've already been, uh, doing here in the city of Los Angeles. Cause I agree, uh, these things shouldn't be, um, interim measures as a as we are a, a immigrant city as we are an immigrant country um but to be clear uh this isn't uh this isn't a charter mandate that would prohibit any amendments to uh the law this is a this is the policy decision which i'm comfortable with because we have supported it but i just want to be clear that we're being transparent about what it is um, but I would like to know, particularly because I know with uh, law enforcement, we don't cooperate. In fact, because we're trying to encourage uh, per, uh, support and cooperation for immigrant communities to report crimes. Uh, it's why Special Order 40 has been, uh, uh, you know, as, you know, astutely followed uh, in the Los Angeles Police Department. So um, I would like it to come back with a report that actually outlines where the uh, where we are falling short um, so that we could better understand what we're talking about, uh, particularly because again, I, I just remember the unintended consequences when we were going through, we were attempting to participate in the reunification of, uh, of children with their families. We were unable to participate uh, because of the policies that we had adopted. So. Um, I'd just like to request that we include a report back along with the ordinance that really outlines um, what, you know, how it's effective so we can actually be really 
um, you know, fully intentional and and uh, comprehensive about making this full commitment uh, for the city and for our immigrant communities. Thank you so much, uh, Councilmember Rodriguez. I, so regarding your, can I just, do you have any language uh, for just, the yeah just, to, yeah, just to report that, to include a report back um, that outlines the very areas that are purported in the uh, preamble and you know, and a, a number of the speakers had uh, suggested that there were cooperative efforts in certain circumstances, whether it was law enforcement, uh, use of city facilities, all of these things. I, I'm trying to ascertain where, in fact, that happened. So I'd like to get a report back on where that has occurred so that we can just be eyes wide open, uh, because I'd like to be informed about that. Um, but uh, in air, you know, I, I'd like to better codify and, and understand where we have in fact been cooperative. Uh, but more importantly, again, just because as we, you know, when we uh, do these things, which again, we already do in terms of, um, as you indicated, this is a policy that is already in place. Um, so this is codifying it, but it doesn't codify it in the city charter. Uh, so it just like any law or policy that we make, it could be redacted and changed uh, with the change of this council going forward. So I just want to be clear and set an expect a correct expectation with the public uh, because there was appeared to be a lot of misrepresentation of, of fact. And so I would just like a report back on where are the areas where the city has cooperated with these federal authorities and uh, used our city resources in that way uh, because I'd like to really you know, look at that very closely. Um, but also because again, I'm, I worry about, you know, um, I, wa I wanna make sure that we do everything possible to honor uh, the immigrant populations that have helped build this city and continue to serve it each and every day. All right, so just, I make sure, thank you so much for the clarity. So you're asking to make an amendment, another moving clause, in other words, uh, I therefore move for, uh, we can say the CAO to look into current gaps that might exist something like that right or how city resources have been used um just to just to report back because it suggests that there has been i'd just like to really understand where that has been the case um because that's not been my understanding yeah okay i i, I will i will second that um from councilman rodriguez uh, another moving clause uh to this original motion that instructs uh, the CAO and relative departments to look at the primary current gaps of our current executive directive uh, and report back just to be consistent uh, within 60 days uh, and see, see what we find from it. I think that's totally uh, fair. Okay, uh, any other questions from uh, my colleagues? Seeing none, okay. Um, so let's vote uh, on Council Member Rodriguez's uh, amendment and then we'll f vote on the full thing. Is that right, Mr. Espinosa? Is that how we? Yes, we'll vote on this item as amended. Okay, so we'll vote on that. Sounds good. And can you uh, just please read uh, what the amendment would be? I mean, I know I kind of said it, but just to have a record of it. Thank you. Um, actually, what I have, I'm not sure if I have it uh, completely, but a report back from the CAO to identify current gaps um, in our, um, our, our previous I would say the, the executive directive, uh, special uh, executive director from Mayor, uh, Mayor Garcetti, uh, we're asking the CAO and all the relative departments uh, as another moving clause of this motion. Yes, and re to report back in 60 days. That is correct. Yes. And uh, Chris, I don't know, maybe it should be at the CLA as well. Would that be helpful? Yes. Thank you. CAO, CLA to do, uh, and relative departments to do a report back on the primary current gaps of uh, Mayor Garcetti's uh, directive um, and within 60 days as an additional moving clause. Excellent. Thank you so much. Sure. All right. Uh, can you please call the roll, uh, Mr. Espinosa? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilmember Soto Martinez? Yes. Councilmember Hutt? Aye. Councilmember Hernandez is absent. Councilmember Price? Aye. And Councilmember Rodriguez? Aye. This item is approved as amended. Thank you so much, Mr. Clerk. Um, can you please uh, read the next item for us? 
Thank you. The next item is a report from the city administrative officer relative to the Los Angeles Justice Fund pilot program closeout and related actions to establish and implement its su successor program um, represent LA. This item was also referred to the Budget, Finance, and Innovation Committee. Thank you so much, Mr. Espinosa. I believe we have uh, several departments uh, to give uh, a report on this item. Um, who do we have from? Well, uh, can we get the uh, CIFD to uh, kick us off? Sure. Uh, good afternoon, council members. I'm here joined by several members of the Community Investment for Families Department. Abigail Marquez, I serve as the general manager. And we do have several members from our team on this call. Uh, Ruth Rodriguez, our executive officer. We have Olivia Mitchell, um, who is on this call. I believe I see Jacqueline Rodriguez, our director, and Ivy Daulo, who's our new senior program manager over our Office of Immigrant Inclusion and Language Access. And I do have other colleagues from the CLA and the CAO on the call. So if we can have them introduce themselves first before we kick it off, Council Member. That's, uh, that sounds good to me. Council Member, uh, uh, Chris Espinosa from the CLA's office to assist. We have our friends from the CAO as well. Camilla Fong from the CAO. And Julie Jacoby from CAO. And if it's okay with you, council member, we can have our colleagues from the CAO and CLA uh, start us off. It, it is their report and we're happy to answer any questions. That sounds, that sounds wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Marco. Good afternoon, Camilla Fong from the office of the CAO. On May 10th, 2022, council adopted an, an amending motion relative to the conclusion of the Los Angeles Justice Fund pilot program and adoption of a new program framework. The CAO and the CLA were instructed to report back on the status of the LAJF pilot program closeout activities and disposition of outstanding cases related to actions to establish and implement the new program represent LA incorporation of city priorities into the memorandum of understanding with the county of los angeles identification of other funding sources and options for a unilateral city legal framework immigrant services framework this report further details the establishment of the represent la program framework and progress on implementation activities this new program is based on a four pillar framework in partnership with the County of Los Angeles, the California Community Foundation, and the Weingart Foundation. Um, I'm available for, for the questions. Also, colleagues from CIFD, CLA, um, as well as some guests and fellow Represent LA partners from LA County Office of Immigrant Affairs, California Community Foundation and the Weingart Foundation. Thank you so much, Ms. Fong. Um, so I'm sure my colleagues uh, maybe will have some questions, but I, I do want to start off by saying that, uh, you know, thank you all for being here and especially for the folks that did this work. Uh, I have just, I'm coming in and uh, this thing is already baked and done. And I know there was, I was sort of following this, uh, uh, this discussion, uh, I think, over a year ago, uh, and I do want to recognize my colleague, uh, Councilmember Rodriguez, that uh, was part of that discussion. Um, and I think you're, you were on the on this committee, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think I think you're the only one that, that's still here. So just for that work, it was budget. Thank you. It was budget. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, and everybody else that worked on this, uh, you know, this really came about um, after uh, Trump was elected. Uh, you know, I, I remember this, this sort of very palpable fear happening in the community and, uh, you know, no one was spared uh, from his hate and the vitriol. Uh, you know, I remember so many protests doing so many clinics and know your rights workshops and preparing our members for, you know, ice raids or I-9 raids. I mean, it was a very, uh, very challenging time. And I think the city rose to the occasion. Uh, they said, you know what, uh, what can the city do? Uh, we created this new, these new funds for folks. Uh, and you know, there's, 
the, the first time you do anything, it, it, it's not perfect, but we get to a place that we can, we can, we can build off of it. We can, we have a foothold in. And I think what we're voting on today, I hope we all vote yes, is to say, you know what, let's just get this to the finish line. Let's get it set. Uh, and then we can talk about, you know, other things we can improve. And I think it's just a phenomenal, uh, wonderful message we're going to send to our entire community that we stand with folks, we stand with the folks that don't have a voice. Uh, and I'm just, just very excited to, to be able to vote for this. This is a conversation that, that I will have with my mom and dad this weekend and tell them this is what the city did. Uh, and I think that's something we should all uh, publicize as much as possible uh, because uh, uh, where oftentimes services lack, that's where we need to fill in and, and do our best uh, and use our power in, in the correct way. And so I hope folks uh, vote yes, but uh, just for the public, um, uh, uh, Mrs. Marquette, can you just sort of give a, a sense of what this will do, uh, what, this, what, kind of, what this program will do for the communities in the city of Los Angeles? I think you're on mute. Yes, thank you, of course. That never ceases to amaze me how we forget to do that. Um, I am gonna have, if it's okay with you, council member, again, we uh, as well are stepping into this work and I do wanna also acknowledge the incredible leadership of our council members and of course, our colleagues in the CAO, CL, CL, CAO and the CLA's office. Our department was created and in, in this year's budget, the previous administration made the decision to transfer this body of work into our department, which we're very excited about. Uh, as a department, through our provision of services, we do serve uh, undocumented individuals across the city. We're very proud of that through our family source system. We're not restricted um, in serving undocumented individuals. So our family source center, as an example, already touches 40,000 Angelinos. Many of them are undocumented. And again, we're very proud of that service provision. But I am gonna ask, I think Chris Espinoza and Cami worked on the MOU and had a lot of conversations with the county. They can walk you through some of the uh, parameters of the MOU and then we're happy to talk about our role as we envision it moving forward. Uh, yes, council member, Chris Espinosa from the CLA's office. In a nutshell, what it, what it does is it's going to transfer 3.75 million and that will go towards community support activities and affirmative immigration relief. Um, the communi community support activities will be um, presentations, resource fairs, um, participation in community meetings, um, campaigns and canvassing to um, let people know about this important service. Um, so really get it into the community to make sure that people have these services available to them. On the affirmative immigration uh, relief, um, these are for um, people that immigrants that are experiencing or at very um, high risk of homelessness, um, unaccompanied children, not in removal proceedings who may qualify for special immigrant juvenile status, immigrants with disabilities, including deafness, blindness, and other conditions um, that may be um, subject to fraud, individuals who may be subject to fraud, asylum seekers, not in removal proceedings, uh, survivors of human trafficking and labor exploitation, so there'll be services in that area, uh, victims of fraud and un unauthorized practice of law. We had discussed previously about sometimes the notarios and those issues of, of not having the ability to practice um, a law here. And then um, temporary protected status, um, beneficiaries, including um, applications and renewals. So all these uh, very um, challenging documents that need to be registered um, they're going to get that assistance. In addition to the 3.75, there's $250,000 set aside for U.S. veterans. Um, this is a very important uh, provision because, um, you know, sometimes immigrants are serving their country and, um, and there's challenges with finally getting that um, U.S. citizen status. Um, we continue to work on that issue and um, we'll report back to the council in six months with a um, program rollout that will be uh, satisfactory to the council. Um, so those are um, the main provisions of it. It's a five-year agreement. It's uh, three with two one-year um, renewal options. And we're working very closely with the uh, County of Los Angeles um, to make sure that this is a success. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. That's absolutely wonderful. Uh, I hope folks out there uh, heard all the different uh, 
sort of advocacy that's going to happen. Uh, so could not be more proud. Thank you so much, Mr. Espinosa. Um, uh, that's all my question, but I see you have a couple colleagues. Uh, Councilman Rodriguez, floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Chris, uh, for uh, <clears throat> for uh, your report. Um, you know, colleagues, I, I want you to know the, the $250,000 was an amendment that I fought for in the budget when we had this conversation. Uh, for those of you that didn't have the benefit, I know Mr. Mr. Price was with me and I wanna thank you for having my back on that. Um, and uh, because in budget committee, because again, to underscore how important of an issue it is um, for uh, those serving our country without citizenship, my father was among those individuals. Uh, when he went to Vietnam. And so for me, uh, you know, my story is a fortunate one in that um, thankfully uh, he found a path forward upon his return from Vietnam that didn't, uh, again, when we know so many individuals struggle with uh, PTSD and whatnot uh, upon their return from uh, service, it like so many of his uh, colleagues did after the Vietnam War, they were turned back and self-medicated with uh, cannabis, for example, which at the time was illegal. Right now on the other side of the border in Tijuana, last year, I went and met with well over two dozen uh, Angelinos that were deported uh, as a result of minor infractions with result, uh, resulting from substance abuse. Uh, substance abuse that was derived from uh, health, health needing to uh, medicate and self-care in the absence of the Veterans Administration providing the services that they were duly, uh, that they were, uh, that they should be afforded. More importantly, they were not provided upon their return from service. The very same, the very same citizenship that they were promised upon completion of their service to our country. And so I want to underscore how important this is because it's offensive to me when we talk about immigrants. And, and by the way, it's not just Latinos. There are Kenyans. There are, there are uh, African-American countries, Asian-American countries that are equally experiencing uh, whose you know, family members, individuals that have come uh, through a legitimate process, just short of having their citizenship status, have served but have been denied by our country the very citizenship they're entitled to as a result of their service. Now talk about just a very simple uh, filing process, perhaps, that they don't even discover at the time of their discharge that they were not provided. They don't discover it until they have some type of legal circumstance which precipitates uh, the, or what triggered that deportation. Now, I, I say all this to you, colleagues, uh, and those that are listening. I say it to you because I've been a little frustrated by some of the pushback I got uh, from suggesting that we could not use this money to tend to the needs of this population. And I say this to you all because we must demand that for all those that are going to help represent these individuals, these are the individuals that have shown patriotism, have fought for this nation, and are coming back and not getting their just due. So when we talk about the population of immigrants and the rights that they have, I would hope that those that have given in service to our country would be among the first that get the representation that they deserve. And so I really want to assure, and I'm asking everybody who's involved in this process, to hold the organizations that are doing that representation, that are gonna be taking this money that we have allocated from our budget, that we have all claimed uh, is, a, is a priority and an important tenant, that they actually fulfill this obligation. Because I don't want excuses. I don't want to find the loopholes for them to get around it. I want them to do what they say they're going to do and, the, and to represent the interests of the individuals that they purport to represent. And so, uh, you know, I, I recognize that under item six of uh, the close out report, 
representation to facilitate the return to the U.S. of a deportee who previously resided or intends to reside in L.A. County. I am happy to introduce you to the more than two dozen individuals that are just sitting outside of San Diego in Tijuana who are eager to come back, back home. And uh, I'm happy to drive anybody there who needs a ride. But uh, I, I just want to underscore this because I don't want any excuses from any organizations uh, that purport to be advocates of this work to not find a way to do what is right and what is just under this justice fund. And um, so I just, I, I wanna say thank you to my colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Price, uh, for supporting this. Uh, it's of personal importance to me, to all those veterans that have served, who have uh, been denied by our country their rightful citizenship for their service. But more importantly, as we have redacted even some of the policies around uh, cannabis, for example, which was uh, the majority of the infractions that triggered uh, their deportation, uh, this is something that I that is easily fixable. And I look forward to our city being among those that leads in correcting this effort. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilmember Rodriguez, um, for sharing your personal story. I know you're very proud of your dad, and um, I'm glad we we're able to rectify some of the, the failures of our government of many years ago. Thank you for, for that amendment. Um, Councilmember Price, floor is yours. Thank, thank you. I, I just want to uh, just co-sign with the Councilwoman Rodriguez has just said. I certainly supported her in that effort. Really, it was a special population that deserves uh, attention and support are our veterans. So I'm gonna, I'll continue to support her and our veterans in that effort. Uh, we know that providing legal services is very, very, very important. In fact, I had a program in CD9 that um, even predated uh, uh, this effort. Uh, uh, we allocated almost a million dollars to provide legal support for uh, uh, our businesses and individuals who were, were facing uh, um, deportation uh, uh, challenges. And so again, this legal assistance I think is important. I'm glad that LA has been able to really be a pioneer uh, and in the forefront of, uh, of meeting this need. Uh, but a quick question of the, uh, apparently there are about 300 cases remaining from the initial 700 uh, as reported uh, in, the, uh, in the report. And so I'm wondering what happens to these other cases? Are they kind of in limbo? Are they going to be retransferred? Is there going to be some other way to accommodate them? What's the status? Um, the program um, intends to roll over um, all the legal services cases over to the new program. And so these um, um, these cases will be uh, taken up by, by the new um, providers. And, and when is this new program going to go into effect? Well, the um, county has already brought on um, a number of nonprofits to um, start getting their training. Um, and so we already have a lead um, program administration, uh, lead uh, subcontractors for data collection and um, defense removal benefits. So there's a number of um, of, of pieces of the structure um, built up. It may take a, a few more months uh, to uh, launch some of the other elements, uh, including the community outreach and getting those um, up in place. But for the most part, uh, um, the organizations have already started to form the, the program. Well, again, the programs are great, but if people don't know about them, you know, it really doesn't mean very much. So uh, I'm, I'm, again, concerned about the community outreach component, how we are informing folks that these services are going to be available, how we encourage them to use them. Uh, and uh, Mr. Chairman, I just hope we can get some feedback, maybe another uh, several months on what the status is, so we can really monitor this as it, as it moves forward. Uh, because as I said, unless uh, people know about the program, can access the program, you know, it doesn't matter how many lawyers we have available, they're not being utilized, we're not meeting our needs. So. Yes, um, your adoption today of the report 
will transfer the funds over to the community investment for families uh, department and then that will um, move on over to the county to start paying for those services thank you thank you thank you mr chairman that's all i have this time thank you so much council member price uh any other questions no okay let's um uh, mr Spinoza, can you please lead us in uh, the vote of this so approve the CEO report and uh yeah, and I think we asked for a report back in 60 days, uh, sort of the community engagement, um, the council member price brought up. Um, can you please uh, call the vote for this item? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council member Soto Martinez. Yes. Council member Hutt. Aye. Council member Hernandez is absent. Council member Price. Aye. And council member Rodriguez. Aye. This item is approved as amended. Wonderful. For all the advocates listening over for this, uh, congratulations for you know this momentous step. I know y'all worked so hard on this, so uh, give a shout out to all the folks doing the work from you know, the grassroots level. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, special, special, special shout out, Mr. Chairman Sue, Cadessa, and Chirla, and, and many of the other organizations that you just referenced uh, that have just been extraordinary and real partners with us in this effort. So. That's right. Absolutely. Uh, okay. Um, Mr. Espinosa, can you please read the next item, please? Thank you. This is a report from the Department of Civil and Human Rights and Equity. Uh, the, sorry, Department of Civil and Human Rights and Equity rel um, relative to an equity an analysis on the violence and crime that black women and girls experience in the city. Thank you so much, Mr. Espinosa. Um, I mean, this is uh, just a, an, an, an amazing thing that we're looking into. Um, you know, I, I want to praise Councilmember Price for just being passionate, uh, you know, on the subject. Um, you know, we have to, you know, I'm going to get on my on my on my uh, soapbox right now, but we have to recognize that uh, this country um, was built uh, on white supremacy, right? And and one of the largest victims of that. Is, is the black community and especially uh, black women, right? Uh, you know, and so what we're looking at, I think is, is the right thing to do again, once again in this committee. And so folks that have been part of this, uh, just wanna give so much praise that we're giving, uh, you know, putting a spotlight on a very important issue. Um, because of the importance and I think approaching this with the, a certain degree of mindfulness um, I, I am going to open up to questions, but I want this item to be continued. I think the discussion we're going to have today uh, is going to inform how we move. I think when we approach a subject as serious as this, it's important that we take a step at a time. Uh, and so uh, with that, I, I do want to uh, allow for a sort of presentation on this and see what, what has been done on this uh, so, so far. Mr. Chair, Capri Maddox here, and I'm ready to present on this matter. Um, Capri Maddox, General Manager, LA Civil Rights Department. Our official name is Civil Human Rights and Equity Department. Um, definitely want to thank you, Mr. Chair, and the committee members. I am joined today by LAPD. Uh, we have Commander Ruby Flores and members of the LAPD family. Um, we have Captain Damian Wyman, uh, Lieutenant Chris, Christopher Chase, and Detective Omar Franco, as well as Ms. Jessica Stateland. I wanna give a special thanks to the team at LA Civil Rights, David Price, Brooke Helmet, uh, Luz Castellanos, Ronald uh, Nell Hampton, as well as Mark Pampaman for actually being a part of making this work happen with a special lift by Brooke Helmet, who will be sharing our screen in just a moment. I want to acknowledge that we have Assistant General Managers Claudia Luna as well as Kim Casaloy here that is providing um, a support in, to our department. And I think we have um, Jemana Celia Saba uh, on, on the line with us. And I don't know if Scott uh, is on the line as well, but um, who handles legislative affairs for us. I want to be um, intentional to let you know that this report is in response to a motion introduced by Councilmember Kern Price and 
uh, council member Marquise Harris Dawson. And I really want to acknowledge um, that one of the members that did a second on this motion was Councilwoman Monica Rodriguez. Um, and this happened in January of 2022. Um, and it, this motion was actually a result of the terrible murder of 16 year old Tyone Theus. Her murder is still unsolved. Many of you are aware that Tyone was a 16 year old girl that was dumped on the side of the 110 freeway near Manchester in the city of Angels right here in Los Angeles. And this motion instructs our department to study this issue as it pertains to black women. Um, however, the data shows high rates of violence for Hispanic women as well. Um, the motion uh, states that Tyone's murder is not unique. Nationally, black women and Hispanic women experience higher rates of violence than their non-black counterparts, non-black and non-Hispanic counterparts, and they receive less attention. Our report sought to explore you know, this issue on a local level, but a lot of the information we found highlighted that this is a national problem and the growing epidemic of violence against women, specifically against women of color and black women, acknowledges that there is an opportunity to bolster um, safety uh, measures for communities that are most impacted by violence. This report maps out the following six items that you see on your screen. This is uh, provides background of this work, as well as um, including a brief note on the murder of Tayoni Theus um, and the exploration of LAPD data. And we um, want to also highlight a, a couple other things. It is a brief survey um, of of positive and negative media um, that impact and influence um, how some of these cases are handled. And it also includes salient notes from discussions with community-based organizations that are involved in this work. Everything we do here at Team Civil Rights always has a community-based organization connection. And we can't thank, be more thankful for some of the partners that actually even help create the department, but continue to undergird and advise us in so many ways. We have um, the ability to identify challenges and in writing this report. And you know, there's some instances where some data was not available for us, but we still were able to move forward. The, um, the last thing I wanted to say about this report is we're providing recommendations and solutions on next steps. But we do understand, Mr. Chair, that we want to uh, take a little bit more time to unpack exactly what those solutions and next steps can be so we can have tangible results. On slide three, um, we have uh, engaged internal and external partners uh, to gather our data. Internally, we've worked with LAPD Comstat Division uh, to gather crime data. And again, thank you to the LAPD partners that are on the line for assisting us in um, the work um, to, to make sure that we have the data to move forward in these spaces. Externally, we, we, we use LexisNexis data to compile information on media representation. And I want to take a moment to thank a, a few partners that really kept and highlighted it, not only this instance, um, particularly this instance of someone being lost uh, to violence. And Beverly White uh, is one of them. I really want to thank Beverly White from formerly with Channel 4 um, NBC News for being one of the reporters that stayed on top of this. Um, Erica Smith from um, LA Times, and a special thanks to a community activist, Najee Ali, that continued to have press conferences and vigils on behalf of Tayoni Theus. And we are externally, um, we are internally grateful for the, the other community partners that actually helped us write this report. We have the Women Against Gun Violence, Peace Over Violence and the Genesee Center. And I also want to acknowledge that we cited our Black girls a great deal in this report. The, um, the next slide really, uh, slide four shows that we have uh, data that was gut-wrenching, but it was very informative. Um, we found that Black women comprise of only 4.3% of the city's population, but 25 to 33% of females um, that are victims of violence. And so just to be clear, only 4.3% of the city's population 
as African American women and girls, but 25 to 33 percent of the female victims of crime in this city. Um, Black women accounted for 28.2 percent of all women reported missing in the city in the last two years, and 32.85 percent of the homicides over the last decade. Um, Black women were almost twice as likely to be victims of aggravated assault compared to their non-Black and non-Hispanic counterparts. And, you know, that's a lot to to take on, but we want to be intentional where we see wrong and where the truth uh, is revealed. We want to make sure that we highlight all aspects of it as well. And to let you all know that Hispanic women made up 37% of missing women in the, in the city of Los Angeles in the last two years. Um, And they also represented 40, um, 42.8% of female homicides over the last decade. And although the Latino um, population is larger in the city than the African American population, we wanted to still highlight how high those numbers are for Hispanic women. Uh, And um, in general, we found the highest rates of violence among women, um, uh, whether it's our Hispanic women um, and our African American women. We know that Black women, given their their size, are more likely to experience um, the violence than any other racial demographic group. Um, I want to also highlight the fact that although violent crime rates have decreased in the city of Los Angeles over the last ten year, in the last ten years. The number of Black women and Hispanic women experiencing violence has remained at a steady high, if if not, you know, has increased over the last, um, you know, decade or the last two years, respectively. I think it's important to know that data from LAPD divisions and the LA Civil Rights Department repair zones, you know, you may know those are the areas where we're doing participatory budgeting and our peace and healing centers. So these repair zones and the, the data from LAPD divisions show that the communities with the highest poverty, unemployment, and environmental hazards are more likely to see rates of violence against women. Um, We have uh, community-based organizations that are consistently um, encountering barriers to funding that present significant changes to, you know, for us to have long-term holistic services available to survivors of violence. Um, And when we think about the survivors of violence, we also have to acknowledge their families a lot of uh, victims of violence are uh, single women. They're ahead of their households. So we need to be uh, sure when we're talking about solutions that we consider the needs of the families. Um, as you can see on the right side of your screen, we also have a line, uh, which is line graphic that actually shows um, the homicides by race in the last 10 years. And the blue line represents Hispanic women and the red line represents black women. And again, I'm thinking about the population size of um, African-American women and to see how high on the chart the African-American population is, is a a big concern. But the number one population, and and when we look at um, the homicides by race in the last 10 years, um, the Hispanic women um, really, you know, have numbers that are unacceptable as well. I just wanted to quickly talk about some of the next steps and we can uh, continue this conversation um, with another report back, but I want to or, or continue um, this matter, depending on whatever the, the, the chair would like us to do. We want to tell you that some of the next steps are thinking about prevention, youth development. There may be um, an opportunity to work with partners like my counterpart uh, and, and, and friend and fellow general manager, Abigail Marquez, over CIFD um, on on family education. Um, of course, youth development would would take me to work with Lisa Salazar, our general manager for the youth development department, and we could even work with um, you know our education for healthcare providers and partners to allow uh, these folks to know that when people are in crisis, they need additional attention and to. Be just aware that the odds are that women of color, particularly African American and Latino women, will uh, need additional assistance. Um, and their numbers bear it out that we are in crisis 
here in the city of Los Angeles. We want to have immediate response um, so that we have incident responses with like victim centered care. We have to be intentional as a city family and um, to be intentional to not re traumatize while we're responding. And um, of course, there are many incidents of, of uh, um, without present danger that may require alternatives to police response. And then the third is the wraparound services. Um, and just to increase resources to community-based organizations and really thinking about even long-term funding. I know we have a program where we have um, short-term funding or maybe even partnering with philanthropic organizations that could help us in these spaces. We want to um, also say increase the training with our community-based organizations, increase the uh, relationships with the community-based organizations and the LAP LAPD partners that are responding and focusing on these crisis points for um, African American women in particular, but also our uh, also the Latino population that is suffering um, in these spaces. The long term um, logistics, thinking about data collection systems and language that identify classifications. A lot of police departments nationwide don't provide um, information that clearly identifies the victims. And so we would like to think about ways that we can capture that intersexual uh, data. Um, and you know, even thinking about our reward offers and our education campaigns. So um, with the end of the, the, the slideshow, I just wanna uh, open the floor for questions. I am here joined with Brooke Helmet, uh, who wrote uh, most of this report and Ronnell Hampton, uh, who are both a part of the Civil Rights Department to um, answer questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Maddox. Wow, um, so many, so many, uh, so many thoughts, so many uh, emotions. Um, I don't even know about questions. All I want to say is that um, you know, I, I think that what we're really talking, we're, a lot of things that we're talking about is is sort of what, and I, I repeat it, right? What this country was built on. Um, the, the level of anti-blackness, anti-women, um, is is in the air. It's it's swimming. It, it's every single day, and so um, you know this this unfortunate this uh, tragedy that happened with uh, with with Tyana Thea is is sort of can lead to something, right? Um, you know, I I would like to see you know really us talk at the at the at the heart of this. You know, I. I would say my personal journey, right? Uh, I grew up in the ninth uh, Councilman of Price, and I talk about it all the time, and that was a, a black and brown community. And until I educated myself about how this, the, the history of this country, uh, and you, there's so many things to add to that, right? Uh, just the, the, from the moment the first slave arrived in Virginia to our economic system, to you know European standards of beauty, to redlining, I mean, I can go on and on and on and on. I learned like how much anti-blackness exists in this country, and it wasn't until my own uh, self-analysis on my um, the Mexican machismo, right? It, it's it's like it's that, that exists in our community, and and my personal journey involves you know reading Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde, and and recognizing right, right all all the things that, that I didn't know about myself. And how I act in this in this space, and I think, moreover, I would say I was very lucky that uh, right out of college, I I was recruited by my union, and that was uh, it was led by women. Uh, it was Marlena Durazo and the housekeepers, uh, and I, I learned at, at the age of twenty three so much of that uh, and how to funnel that into activism and. I think uh, you know my mentor, one of my mentors, Reverend James Lawson, uh, taught me how. You bring spirituality into that work, uh, everything that you do. So, uh, I, I'm really um, engaged in trying to uh, be the strongest advocate I can be on this subject, and that is by allowing others to lead. Uh, this is a subject that that I'm not affected by. It's, it's not my community. I'm not the gender, uh, and so I, I'm going to follow a lot of, of the lead of this. Um, but as you can see in my sort of my words, is 
we have to talk about the root of this, right? That the, the economic system, the, the, the sexism, the misogyny. Uh, and so I'm very excited about the education piece because that's where I want to see uh, the city really throw down and, and you know, really enlighten people at a, at a very young age uh, on a lot of these subjects. I, think, I do think those could be very transformative because that's how, that's how I have arrived. And I still have a lot of work to do, but it's about education and mentorship. So um, I, I don't have any questions, but I, I do want to uh, yield the floor to my colleagues. Uh, so I will go for those uh, that haven't spoken yet. Uh, so uh, Council Member Hutt, uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you, Chair. Um, Capri, th this was an incredible report and so necessary. You know, uh, this is an opportunity to really talk about the ugliness and then this is how we can fix it. Losing girls on the street is, you know, just a painful situation. Um, sex trafficking is prevalent in our in our country it, and we have various tracks in Los Angeles that abuse girls and it's because of poverty it's because they they don't see another way it's because they have not been exposed to another way or have the opportunities and access I hope that this report helps us do better with our girls that are black and brown. And I stand proudly with my colleague, Kern Price, for, you know, really lifting up this issue because it's, it's deplorable that we lose girls and women every day. I don't know if you guys remember there, the man who was a mechanic and had a family and he killed like 20 some people in South LA, do you remember? Because we are lost and, and we're not found. And so I really hope that um, I could be a great partner in this space. Um, I did a lot of work in, in um, human sex trafficking and human trafficking, and then also in um, child sex trafficking, which leads to these losses, in, you know, as one of the foremost issue. There are so many more, but that's one of the foremost issues. I'm proud to be on this committee and, and to really have this really hard conversation. So thank you for your report, Ronnell and Brooke, for your hard work, you know, bringing uh, um, the data to the table. And, and then um, I'm ready for next steps, whatever that looks like, and to work hard to make change. But thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. And we definitely look forward to working with you um, in these spaces. Uh, and I think you touched on one point that I didn't really get a chance to, to mention is the fact that they have interviewed serial killers that say that they at least start or if not focus on African-American women and girls because they know they're more likely to get away with their crimes because the clearance rate may not be as high. And people are less likely to look for them That's and, right. and, and, and to just know that there's a target um, on you based on your skin color, even from predators is another thing that's as exhausting as being an African-American woman. So we really look for and need your leadership. And I'm so excited uh, to know that we can work with a trusted partner like you to, to move things forward. You've helped us on a number of things and we're gonna just add this to your plate as well. Thank you so much, Council. Thank you. I get, I get, I'll take a platter and let's just fill it up because we got to work and fight together. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Council Member Hyde. Uh, Council Member Rodriguez, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, well, Capri, Brooke, Ronnell, thank you all so much for this incredible report. Um, you know, obviously there are moments that evoke uh, this response. And I want to thank uh, Councilman Price uh, and Mr. Harris Dawson uh, for, you know, for inviting me to be part of the conversation uh, to create this report back, which doesn't just a show, doesn't just reflect the, uh, the violence. Obviously, you, you, we see uh, Latinas among the most prominently affected, 
Um, so what, what you go in with is what you end up walking out with is uh, showing that the numbers are substantially greater uh, for another demographic. But the real story is not just black or Latina, it's all women. It's assaults against women and it's a global pandemic. It isn't just- That's not just it. Right. It's, it's mm -hmm. not just in Los Angeles. It's not just in this country. It is a global pandemic of assaults against women. And I wanna raise that because it is women that are going to be part and with some great allies, uh, but it is women that are gonna help change the course of this action. Uh, I, uh, you know, have engaged with uh, the United, you know, the United Nations. Uh, I have met with many individuals that are helping to turn the page on this. Obviously, uh, Capri, you're no stranger to DART and the work that we need to do and continue to do. And I want to uplift all, all of our organizational partners, uh, you know, Patty Giggins and everybody that does so much to help prevent all the survivors who share their strength in um, making sure that this history doesn't get repeated. But most importantly, what I, I wanna underscore, uh, because you know we see it in Mexico with uh, you know, uh, the disappearance of women. And we, so, so I, you know, I just wanna, I, I wanna give rise to the fact that this is not just an, a Los Angeles or a, or a United States issue. This is how women are undervalued continue to be uh, disrespected and abused and uh, from our young girls uh, to adults, doesn't matter. It's a function of men not valuing us. There's a reason why historically, uh, even in the halls of power, there's been an absence of women. And that is because it's an, engen it's, it's an engendering and a power dynamic that wants to preserve power not for people who look like us, but for, you know, this is, this is a gender issue. And we also know that this violence is underrepresented. Uh, we saw through the course of the pandemic in the very early days, uh, the artificial suppression of even the reports of assault and violence was because many victims were trapped with the, their assailants. And so, we got a lot of work to do, um, and uh, you know, I'm just uh, thank you for helping to bring to light. Um, again, this is, uh, in my opinion, you know, we can break out the, these numbers by demographic. Um, clearly, what has projected is the violence against you know with uh, with Latinas in in in, in this just the the substantial numbers. Um, but I just want to make it real clear. This is about women. And this is about how women are undervalued, how we continue to, uh, you know, th this is just, uh, this is a historic uh, dynamic. And it's important, not just, you know, I, I've been thinking about this, um, you know, with respect to Women's History Month. And Capri, you know, you were there when we had International Women's Day, and I said every day is International Women's Day for those of us that are in positions of power to help change and do something about it. Well, I'll tell you folks, I'm gonna tell you right now, and I'm making this declaration for the rest of the city of Los Angeles to hear. Uh, Women's History Month, I'm gonna proclaim it every day that I'm serving in office. Um, and it's not gonna be dedicated to one month because we've been denied for too many years. So I'm gonna take every single day of every single month that I get to uplift how disproportionately we are underrepresented and make it woefully uncomfortable for people to be able to silence us going forward. So I just wanna thank you all for your report on this. Uh, and, uh, uh, oh, and I see uh, my friend Commander Flores on there, who's helping to make sure that women are represented in our, our department. Listen, we got a lot of work to do, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and uh, I just want to thank you for, uh, for bringing this to light and know that you've got a champion and an ally in me. And, uh, you know, this work will continue. We will, uh, we, uh, we, got a, we got a lot to do, but you, you know you have a partner in me to, 
to lead that change with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Very grateful. Thank you so much, uh, Councilmember Rodriguez. Um, Councilmember Price, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I certainly uh, want to just co-sign the comments made by Councilwoman Rodriguez and Councilwoman Hutt. Uh, they, they've been uh, uh, not only allies, but sources of inspiration as we try to figure out how to make things better. I just want to let you know I appreciate that. Um, special shout out, of course, to Capri and to uh, the team. You guys have done an extraordinary job, I think, on, on the report that's, uh, you know, we've been asking for for uh, several months. Uh, but uh, you have, uh, the team has stepped up and I want to thank everybody uh, that, had a, that had a role in it. Uh, and again, Capri, thank you for your leadership in, in making sure that it all comes together. Um, that's, that's important. Uh, and to the chair, thank you, sir, for your, your willingness to continue this item and to continue the conversation, continue the discussion. Uh, because you're right, there's a lot to, to unpack in this. You know, I certainly uh, was inspired uh, by the, the tragedy of uh, Tioni Theus when I made this motion. But as we, as we reported, it's not just an issue here in Los Angeles or in California. It really is a global uh, pandemic of, of assaults against women, black and brown. I think that's certainly something that, that the report made clear. Uh, black and brown uh, women are the, the ones who suffer the most. And so uh, I'm proud that uh, we have at least created a, a framework for, for discussion, a framework for action. Uh, you know, I think it's uh, significant, these four areas that you've identified, prevention, immediate response, wraparound services, long-term logistics, I think do ad adequately kind of frame the discussion. But it's a discussion that, uh, that we have to really have and deep, dig deep into. Uh, and so I'm proud, uh, uh, proud to accept this report, proud that we're going to be continuing uh, the discussion, uh, figuring out what specific steps we want to take. I think, and I think everyone has sort of pointed this out, we have a chance to be very intentional, uh, very specific. And so uh, I look forward to working uh, with my colleagues on the council and staff as we try to, and the community, as we try to better understand the phenomena and then figure out how we can address uh, the inequities that, uh, that occur, that negatively impact these, not just these individuals and their families, but our whole community. Our community takes a back seat whenever these crimes uh, are committed. Uh, and, uh, you know, as was pointed out uh, earlier, you know, this tragedy with the, the Tioni Theus happened several years ago, and there's still no answer. Still no answer. So you can imagine the heartbreak and, and her family, immediate family, friends who are just torn uh, by this. Uh, and it's been, but it's been repeated over and over and over again. And we really got to draw some attention to it and come up with some solutions to prevent it. So uh, I look forward to the next steps working with the my colleagues and uh, with staff on next steps and figuring out, you know, how we can fashion a program, a plan uh, to address the issue, keep, continue to shed light on the problem, but to how we can address the issue as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much, uh, Council Member Price. Um, I see uh, Commander Flores has her hand raised. Uh, I uh, uh, yield the floor if there's no objection. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Capri, thank you so much for your time. Um, I do appreciate uh, the work that went into this report, uh, as well as the support. It looks like my camera went away. Can you all not see me? Yeah, your camera's off. Mm -hmm. There you go. Oop. Now you're on mute. Ruby, you're on mute and we can't see you. Yeah. Let's give it a, a, a there you go. Okay. We can see you, but we can't hear you. You're on mute. Oh. Let's see. Uh, Looks like she's on her phone. Yeah, it might be. Uh, 
Okay. Well, I'd be a shame if we didn't hear from her and she wanted to speak. Okay. I can, I have sound, but no camera. Okay. So. Wonderful. Wonderful. My apologies. Right. Thank you. Floor, floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, sir. So I do want to reiterate and reaffirm what was already said in terms of, of shining a light on the inequities affecting women. And, and like you all too, this is, it's alarming. And it's certainly something that we have to, we have to fix. Um, we, you know, it's something that I, I don't share often or, or have told many people, but I was a victim of a violent crime before I became an officer, which is part of the reason why I became an LAPD officer as well, because of I, I learned um, at that time how victims were treated and what little resources I had as, as a woman. Um, so there are many other women, many other police officers like me who came on the job to assist our victims, to work with our victims, and to be that... Um, that beacon of hope for them. So you know, I commit to you, this is you know, what we want to do uh, citywide, continue to, the partnerships, uh, embrace the recommendations that were in the report. Uh, but I think to um, Councilwoman Monica Rodriguez's point in terms of you know, women coming together um, to help fix this problem, solve this problem, it really starts with us in, in the department as well, which underscores the reason why we need more women in the police department. Uh, there's many studies that show that women support one another. Uh, we are more compassion, compassionate. We are, are more welcoming, approachable by our victims. Um, so I think we can help uh, help um, create that safety net for our, our community. So I think just a, another example of, of uh, the value that women bring to the job um, and for our communities together. So we will look to the recommendations of these of this report. Um, I'll present this to the chief of police and then we can move forward together. Look forward to doing this with, uh, with Cred and Ms. Uh, Maddox's group because they've been uh, exceptional in, in putting this report together. It was a long time coming in terms of gathering the data with them and for them. So I was eager to read this report as you were as well. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you so much, uh, Commander Flores. I appreciate your words. Okay, so if there are no more questions. Um, I would like to, uh, you know, this was a very uh, sort of open and vulnerable conversation that we had. Um, I think it's important that we, we take this and we, we, we sit, we let it ruminate uh, and come back um, with like, concrete steps that we could do. So uh, if there's no objection, I move to continue the item. Uh, we could bring it back here uh, when we have some concrete steps. Um, Miss Mr. Chair, can I just tell you all, thank you so much for keeping the memory of Tayoni Theus alive with us and making what happened to her matter to Angelinos and all over the world, also to the point of Councilwoman Rodriguez talking about um, pandemic, epidemic, and these spaces. You know, today is was the day three years ago when we shut down the city of Los Angeles because of the pandemic of COVID-19. And um, we're at a place now where we're on our way out of you know that pandemic, but the pandemic epidemic of what is happening to women um, in all over the world um, is, is something, the pandemic of what's happening to women all over the world is um, a violence, is, is something that we are willing at Team Civil Rights, Civil Human Rights and Equity Department to move forward. So thank you so much for uh, the council's support and the leadership in this committee. In particular, a, a big thank you to the council member Price for uh, moving this forward and just staying on it. And I know he has the Figueroa corridor in his district. And so uh, some of the things we wrote in this report are still happening. Um, and so, you know, time is of the essence. So we will, um, have, as soon as you all, you know, direct us, we will work as hard as we can to make sure that we lift this work to the next level to make sure that we have tangible steps for this body. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Maddox. Um, have full faith in, in your leadership to, to carry that out as well. Okay, uh, Mr. Espinosa, uh, please call the vote on that, on that, please. Well, on this one, we don't need a vote just because we don't have an action that's moving to council. Okay, all right. All right, thank you so much. Um, do we have anything else uh, to discuss? No, the desk is clear. 
Okay, well, thank you so much. And uh, I'll leave folks with uh, one of my favorite quotes from Bell Hooks that I pulled up, because I think when we do this work, it's always good to act from a place of love. Whenever I act, I always think, am I doing this because I'm feeling hateful because I'm feeling like love for my community. And so, you know, the moment we choose to love, we begin to move against domination, against oppression. And so with that, I leave you all and have a wonderful weekend. Everyone.